Now, let's turn to our home place. So we've talked about where, when the burials begin in our uh, area, particularly Longdale County. Uh, 1820, a little bit easier to remember than 1818, right? Around 1820, we show up, you know, we do all the things that Euro-American settlers do, um, and we take the land and possess it, and we have dead people to bury. Um, so, where are we gonna do it? Well, we just talked about hallowed or unhallowed spaces and the discomfort by many groups to say we can't really bless that, but we'll bury people next to the church anyway. Um, you see this in Scotland as well, because uh, in Scotland, uh, the majority of people convert to Calvinism in the mid 1500s, ancestors of the Presbyterians and the Baptists. Uh, they throw out all of this earthly blessing stuff as fast as they can out the window, but by golly, you bury in the churchyard. Don't you mess with any of those random burials out there. <laughs> Put them in the churchyard. Okay, so um, we have this designation of space. This contributes to visibility and invisibility for us. Right? Visibility because elite burials are very visible. Right? For example, the Rowell Cemetery that we worked on out in Smithsonian has, from the beginning, a stone wall about 12 inches thick around the whole cemetery. It's hard to miss. Right? <laughs> about 40 feet on a side, right? five feet tall or so, right? heavy masonry. And it has big obelisks in the middle. You can't miss it. A funny story about that. We um, mapped it and documented it, and then we got a call saying the obelisk is down, the main obelisk is down. Somebody's vandalized it. Somebody who's driving, who knew us, the, the people on the Lauderdale County Cemetery Authority group, noticed it driving into work. So I called it in to the sheriff. Sheriff goes out, sends someone out. Yep, sure is down. Uh, no idea who does it. I was interviewed by the newspaper, they took pictures, and within a week, mysteriously, it was re-erected. Perfectly. Somebody brought in heavy equipment, put it back perfectly. The brass shims that had leveled the obelisk were back in place. Right? Visibility is really important for preservation. Just go on 48 views and that's all it takes. Right, so it's there. But the other thing is, remember, if you're burying two, three, four, five at a time, they become invisible very, very quickly. Because they're just out in the woods. They're on the corner of the field. They're in a waste area. Um, so when you are trying to find out about a historical burial site um, in North Alabama, you have to look at a lot of clues. First of all, um, all white and African American, Euro American and African American graves are oblong. There's been no shaft burials, um, other than possibly some very, very, very old Native American burials. So if you find a round depression, it's not a burial. Right? People have been laid out to be buried here. Now, this gets back to theology. How should they be laid out? And there's a geography to this. It's actually very, very, very important. It's up there with the inviolability of the body. Ice and east. What's that? Ice and east. Yeah. Why? The Lord comes and... That's right. Your feet are to the east, your head is at the west end, so when the last trumpet blows, you... Right? Your body is reconstituted. You rise from the grave facing Jesus coming for the second time right, to judge the living and the dead. Wow. Okay. So, you see how this is locking in? Oblong depressions or other signs aligned in one particular way. You can start to see where these things are. Not easily, because it helps if you have other historical information, but most burials in North Alabama 
by Christians at least attempt to do this. Uh, I'll point out that they attempt to do this because there are cases in which there's a lot of randomness. I'm going to go into that in some detail in uh, a moment. Because east, quote unquote, could be where the sun rises. Anybody know why that's a problem? Because we're at 35 degrees north and the sun never rises in the east. It always rises south of east. So you, and, and it rises in a different place every day of the year. So you go out and you bury in January, right? You're gonna be very, very far south of east at sunrise. You go out in June, you're gonna be very much closer to east, never all the way east, because the declination of the sun is changing. Right? You will be burying in a different orientation. And I've seen that where you can see that people try their best to bury east-west, but they're in, you know, in one line in the cemetery. There's, oh, January, June, you know, August. Um, I have not done the, the actual statistics, but that's my theory right now. Because after all, they send you out with a pickaxe and a shovel, by the way, through the 1970s and 80s in small graveyards. And they say, dig a grave. And two or three guys with a pickaxe and a couple of shovels go out there in the morning and say, there's the sunrise. Yep, sure is. Drive a stake in there, Bubba, and <laughs> dig that sucker out. <laughs> right? You're doing the best you can. And there's a certain, you know, holiness about it. The sun's rising, right? It's the correct place. Um, roads. An assumption that county roads run north, south, east, west. Great example. <laughs> Great example of this is Bailey's uh, Chapel Cemetery, Black Cemetery on County Road 71, um, just east of Killen. If you know County Road 71, it runs southwest to northeast, and that's that's east, right? That's the way the graves ought to be lined up. Right? After a while, they kind of, you know, somebody brings out a compass, they think, wait a minute, yeah, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> and things change around. But people are grabbing onto what they can. Um, property lines. Again, an assumption that somehow all of our property lines were laid out by the standards of the Northwest Ordinance or eventually the National Survey. So you have section lines running right east, west, and north, and south. And all you got to do is line up with those. Well, those were laid out on contract by people who were paid by the mile, right? Get the picture, you have 500 miles of wilderness, you have a compass and you have an ax, and you're supposed to define property line. By the way, if you own rural, rural property, their mistakes are your property lines now. Because according to property law, the original markers for corners and lines are the true markers. So, you know, before you buy real property, find out you actually know where it is, not where somebody thinks it might be. Okay, so, grave markers, okay? This is another part of ritual. Um, and it seems odd to us, but do you care who is there? This is another question. Maybe, maybe not. Right? This is a cultural issue. So I'm going to run through some of the types of things that we see um, that help us know something about the cultural element of how people are being buried. And these are to some degree tied with time. Right? So every burial is a, a historical document. It's telling you something about the culture of people who buried and something about the life of the person who's buried there. So uh, step one is no marker at all. Um, are there a lot of them, guys? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we went like more than. Yeah, we went first. to Littleberry Harrison Cemetery right by the post office in Killen, and Lee, who is the guru of documents, found the documentation for it that had been done earlier. Um, what was it like? Half a dozen graves yeah, and seven, a handful. Seven or eight marked. Several unmarked. Yeah, a handful of unmarked graves. We got out of there with ninety-three documented graves. That's what a good ground search and testing of depressions did. 
Okay, a few unmarked graves. You can repeat that almost every deeper historical cemetery around the county. So there are lots and lots of unmarked graves. Okay, um, is this on purpose? Well, you don't know because there's no marking, right? Um, is it the damage of time? Um, a cemetery which Lee could name, but we probably won't right now. Um, the new curators who have relatives buried there decided that undecipherable old stones did not need to be in the cemetery. They got in the way of the uh, mowing equipment and you couldn't read them anyway. So they just pulled them up. Those graves are now unmarked, right? But that's, you know, you have to chalk that up to the ravages of time rather than the intentionality of the people that made the burials. Um, field stones. This is, uh, you know, in my mind, if you're building a typology or a system of things that you're evaluating by, this is the next stage. So um, you would know it if you saw it, right? These are rocks that do not have regular shape. They have not been shaped. They're most typically laid flat on the ground or dug into the ground, usually at the head as far as we can tell. Um, and that's all there is to it. It's a rock, right? Here's the grave, here's the rock like this, rarely put upright, mostly laying down, sometimes head and foot and smaller typically at the foot, larger at the head. Um, and that's it. So what, you know, th this is when you start asking cultural questions. Was it unimportant to know who was there? Right, that's, from our point of view, that's a question. Um, I would argue that that's our problem, not their problem. Because what I've experienced, particularly with African-American cemeteries, is I'll, locate a lot of unmarked graves. And then if I'm walking around with someone from the descendants of people at that cemetery, I'll stand here and say, you know, what about this unmarked grave? Oh, that's Uncle Fred. What do you mean that's Uncle Fred? Oh, because I was standing there when he was buried. So I had a woman in one cemetery, actually, we were, this was in Germantown, Tennessee, and, and so I was in the classroom teaching, there was a break, and she said, come on out to the cemetery with me. Um, and uh, I want to show you something, I want to ask you a question. So we walk out to the cemetery, and she said, there's a grave here. And I said, well, it sure looks like it. You know, there's a depression, right shape. You know, I'll, I'll do the probing, which is an iron, a steel rod that you push into the ground to see if there's soft dirt, right? Soft dirt and shafts stay soft for 100, 200 years. You can tell the difference. I said, yeah, sure looks like it to me. Yes, this is my uncle. Okay, well, how do you know that? Because I was, this is the grave. I was standing here when they lowered him in the grave. How do you know that? Because I remember the sound of the dirt hitting the coffin. And when I stood here, that big oak tree was on the edge of this little sinkhole that still has trees in it. And I could see that. She was five or six years old, or seven or eight years old when this happened. Right? Just because it's unmarked doesn't mean that the people that care don't know about it. It means that you don't know about it as a researcher. Right? So unmarked doesn't mean unknown necessarily. If you can get into the community of descendants and they can help you know. Uh, we saw this at Armistead Cemetery. You know, we saw it at, at the, the Coffee Cemetery. At the Coffee Cemetery. We saw it at, at the Brandon. Cemetery, Brandon, and those cemetery. early ones weren't marked on purpose because the African American tradition at the time was not to. Mark yeah, and we're going to be talking about that in, in just a minute. So the next step, um, I would argue, are native stone slabs. I'm differentiating here. You may have seen this, or if you spent some, I would call it misspent time, but time wandering the creeks and the woods around here. Uh, when you see a, where a bluff is or a creek, you'll see layers of stone, sandstone or limestone. This is the next step, you find the nearest creek or bluff, you go in there, you break off a slab. Um, typically you make it re relatively rectangular and put it upright. Sometimes you point the top, Old Baptist, up toward the Tennessee line, 
um, around Green Hill. Most of them have been pointed at the top. Most of the rest are squared off at the top. And sometimes then something scratched in. Uh, sometimes something uh, scratched into that otherwise undeveloped stone. Um, I find those some of the most fascinating because some of them I've seen go all the way from people who probably could not write their whole name easily. Just taking a piece of iron or even just a piece of chert and scratching right initials into the rock. All the way to beautifully written things that look like they come out of a cemetery in Scotland. You know, beautifully cut letters, perfectly aligned, right? And, and you know, very solid message, you know, birth, death, some kind of verse, all included. So, um, then we get into, com well, there's a lot of things that can be included there. Vernacular monuments like pieces of cinder block, um, other types of detritus like that. One cemetery um, had someone who was in the marble counter business. So when they broke a counter putting it in, he would give them off cuts so they could break off a piece from use it as a marker. Um, so commercial monuments. These are symbols of prosperity if you're looking at 1820 to say 1950. Um, because they're expensive um, and they're often made out of non-native materials uh, cut by professionals in other places. So um, I see them as symbols of prosperity and achievement. For example, in the Armistead Cemetery uh, in Lauderdale County, uh, the two oldest known burials, because there are quite a few unknown burials in there, uh, are a couple Married couple who were born in slavery, they were adults when emancipation came, and by the time they died, their family could afford to put up obelisk monuments to them. You see what kind of story that tells? They did not own themselves when they were born. By the time they die, their family can put up five or six foot stone professionally cut monuments over their graves. This still angers some people because one of them was knocked down a year or two ago uh, by some vandals. Now, luckily, they, you know, it's been put back up again, but I just can't imagine that kind of hatefulness. You know. Anyhow, um, so what, is the, what do we see in style of monuments? Um, talking about our regional culture. There's a strong uh, point to be made for something that's called frontier conservatism. It's kind of maybe a new idea. Some of you have heard of this before. Um, what it means is when you travel to a new place, right? And Alabama is the frontier, right? It's, it's still the frontier in 1861. Understand that in Southeast Alabama, there, the Homestead Act is still operative in the late 1800s. You can homestead land in Southeast Alabama. Hi, this is Lee Freeman, and you're watching North Alabama Local History. Considered unright government land that is unsettled. So this area, 1820, as you know, is very much on the frontier. If you know that story about Belmont Mansion, right, they build the mansion, and, and the people in the mansion are upset because Native Americans come up and bang on the windows. They've never seen glass before. So, they, you know, they come at, you know, as soon as the sun comes up, they start banging on the glass. What is that stuff? Um, this is very, very much the frontier through that whole period. Again, that antebellum period is very, very short here, 40 years. Uh, very, very, very short, historically. Um, but during that time, right, a large part of our population shows up. Well, there's a theme in geography called movement, human movement. And when people move, they bring their bodies, right? Alive, in that case, mostly. Um, they bring their things, and they bring their ideas. Right? This is all part of what you bring with you when you move. And what happens, the frontier conservatism, is what happens when you leave an area that is civilized. You go out somewhere else where it's really not very civilized. 
and you become the founders of culture there. So say you come in 1825. You know what the tidewater was like in 1825, right? And you come to Alabama and you lose touch. So in 1860, you still think it's 1825 back in, right, Carolinas, Virginia, right, coastal Georgia, and you're still doing things that way. They've, they've moved on. You are the frontier conservative, right? You've continued to do things that are not like the place you came from because that place has changed. This is shown in language, right? It can be, show up in material culture, right? The things that people use, the things that people make. Um, and it's very, very clear in our area, um, particularly in these grave monuments where um, the, uh, Historic Cemetery, Liberty Cemetery in Rogersville, you go into the core of it. If I took the pictures of the core graves there and took them to my friends in Scotland, they would ask me, where in Scotland did you take these pictures? And they died about 1750, didn't they? These are 1830 to 1850 graves in Rogersville the monument style, the writings, the inscription style, looks like a hundred years before in the UK. Right? Which makes sense if you think that people involved in the 1798 uprising against the British in Ireland right, were forced out, and these were not our idealized, you know, poor, Irish peasants. These are the Jacksons. These are people like that. The right? Yeah. Come to the United States carrying with them everything the way it was in 1798. And they end up on the frontier. And so what are they going to do in 1820, 1830? What they know as their home culture. And so we get a lot of those kinds of elements. And that tells you again about symbol the symbolic side. Because you could come to the new world in a new place and just bury any way you wanted to, right? But you're not going to do that. And grandma really wouldn't like that. <laughs> right? And you want grandma coming down the chimney. Uh, because that's the other side of it is that no matter how evangelized a population is in Christianity, it maintains pre-Christian or non-Christian elements and ideas about the dead. And that's part of all of this as well. For example, is a graveyard some place that you visit? Well, we do, right? You go at night? Okay, got some brave souls, right? That kitty's going, no. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> not. Not doing that. Uh, why not? What's the difference? Because there's haints at night, right? <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble with them. Um, Okay, so symbolic elements here. Um, I'm going to trace for you. I'm not going over time here. No, I'm about to give you this last example here. Um, okay. As the Latin saying says, time changes all things. So I want to return to that time factor and run through um, a time scheme that I believe applies to uh, African-American burials um, in, the, um, in the South. And that is that you get several phases according to um, enslavement and transportation from Africa, and then assimilation to Euro-American culture. Now that's, in any other group, that would be considered absolutely normal, right? You come to America, you eventually do everything American. Um, but here, because of our racial issues, this is very controversial stuff. So the first step is African people brought to America bury exactly the same way they did in Africa. Now I know this doesn't fit the Uncle Tom's Cabin idea of what slavery was like, but archaeologists can go to tidewater plantations, right, 1600s, 1700s, and find a, an African burial ground 
excavate it and tell you what county it came from in West Africa. Not like what general place, but like within a few miles. What does that tell you? They were speaking their own language, they were allowed to keep their own customs, and they're buried in their own way. Thank you very much. Now, what happens next? Well, right, 1619 project, 1619 is a whole long time ago. And time passes, fewer and fewer people are in, brought in from Africa, and cultures start to get mixed. Right? And around 1800 or so, many slave owners begin to change their attitude about evangelization. Up to 1750 or 1800, the dominant idea among slave owners is, I don't care what their religion is as long as I get them to work. Right? There's a few evangelizing owners out there, but most of them really don't care. Um, as we get into the period of the Great Awakenings in the United States, um, many slave owners begin to believe they must convert their enslaved people. They must make them Christian at some level. Um, and so that starts to sweep through those communities. And it affects burial practices. Right? What, how are they burying in the generalized West African tradition? Well, in ways that makes it really easy to lose those cemeteries. Um, graves are randomly aligned. They are not in rows. They are in clumps or groups. They point every which way. There are no stone markers and there are no fences. There weren't ever supposed to be. At most, you get um, evergreen prickly plants planted possibly at head and foot. There is one of these at Bailey's Chapel. There's a replacement granite marker from the late 20th century. The original grave is marked, has no markers, marked head and foot with cedar trees. That woman was buried in the 1940s. All right. Right? You have that tradition. Now, what happens once people are getting here? Once you get into North Alabama, importation from Africa is fairly negligible into our area. It's happening in New Orleans, right? Those big plantation areas happening in some of the coastal areas. But what happens here is that owners, again, um, name your big plantation in Lauderdale and Calgary County. Their enslaved people were marched across the mountains, right, and brought in their own sort of trail of tears from the tidewater to here and put to work. And they were then, owing to that, their cultures were mixed. They didn't speak African languages anymore. They all spoke English. And they had different right, group backgrounds. So what could they do that was sort of like what we are? And you start to get a hybrid, a little bit of marking, maybe straightening it out a little bit, um, right? It's starting to get more and more organized, right? There's a hybridization of it. You know, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of original culture. And then, of course, the final point is you can't tell it from any other kind of cemetery. Right? Because everything is lined up nominally east-west. There are monuments with names on them, right? It looks like anybody else's cemetery. Right? There is no one kind of African-American burial in the last 400 years. You have to look at the time frame of what you're looking at. Right? Time makes a big difference. Similarly, there is a time horizon set for poor white burials. Right? A lot of really poor white burials, they're randomly aligned, there are no markers, and there's no fences. So. See the picture here? Are they black? Are they white? Mm, I don't know. They look like they're down there, right? There are depressions. You can probe them and show that they are pits. Remember, all of this is indicative. You never know for sure unless you dig to the bottom and you find human remains. We're not qualified to do that. Um, we can give you a probability, but not a certainty. But you could walk into the same piece of woods, look at it and say, 
Okay, poor whites, or maybe poor blacks. You might not be able to tell. And the next phase is equally as confusing because it's the field stone stage, right? Things start to get lined up in their field cells and they're no names, so you still don't know. Now, sometimes you get a hint by place because if any of you grew up on farms, you know that one of the things that you hate to do is waste plow land, right? You want to plow anything you can plow up. And even if that's just a few extra yards here or there, it adds up to a couple of acres, right? Okay, are you going to bury people on plow land? No, right? It's just throwing money in the river. So you look for places you can't plow, right? Where there's a little rise, for example, in the middle of a field. You've all seen this, right? Right by a big field, there are all those trees in the middle. That's because people couldn't plow it, and that's where they dumped their rocks. It was a great place to bury people, right? I'm not going to use it anyway. Uh, or the edge of a field that runs on at a creek, right? And so here's the edge of the field, right? And you've got those little noses that run out toward the creek. You can't plow those, right? Certainly not with modern <coughs> plowing equipment, even hard with a mule. So you plow across the edges of them, right? And then you've got those tongues sticking out. What a great place for a cemetery. Also, it has other non-Christian elements for a cemetery. Not only is it profitable, because Right, you're not going to be able to plow it. But it looks out from a high place over a view. You remember your Old Testament? Let us worship in high places. <laughs> right, blows hot and cold. You know, go to hell for it. That's what I'm telling you to do. You know, you can look it up. But high places, views, right, those things seem to be a kind of space that people look for. So if there's one thing that I can tell you to close it out, right, our quote, you'll never get out of this world alive, uh, <laughs> and also that this is all bound in history. The only constant is death confuses us, right? There are physical issues that we have to deal with, but even more the emotional differences and how from generation to generation, how we deal with that changes. So, leave you with one last story here. The black burial succession that I mentioned. One of the problems in many areas, uh, in a number of areas, I can't say many, but in a number of areas with African American cemeteries is people won't go there. They won't maintain them, they won't go there. This is very perplexing. We were working in Germantown, Tennessee. And uh, if you think you had some nerves today, um, I'm out there working with a plane table, mapping equipment for the graduate student and some people. And uh, this guy comes up, one of the guys at the congregation says, um, you're supposed to come to the meeting of elders. The pastor says you have to come to the meeting of elders. And if you know black churches, this is like going to the Inquisition. This is really serious. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, okay, what do I tell these people? Like, go in. And, um, you know, I'm the white university quote unquote expert, and there is this panel of men from probably 85 down to 30 who are the elders of this church. And so I'm explaining to them what we found, you know, how we've tried to help document it so they can find people and maintain it, um, and um, mention a few of the preservation problems. And one of the younger guys says, well, why haven't Anybody, why hasn't anybody been paying any attention to this? And the woman who asked us on this project couldn't get anybody to take care of the cemetery. And you know, this was very puzzling. She was trying very hard. Nobody really was helping her except one or two other women. You know, she got us out there as a volunteer group to help. And so I'm sitting in front of this group and I think, okay, I'm just gonna stick my foot in my mouth here. Uh, <laughs> And so I answered the young man's question. I said, these older gentlemen can correct me any way they want. But that's because in the deeper African-American tradition, cemeteries are dangerous places full of dangerous things. You bury someone with proper respect, you get out of there, and you stay out of there. 
They are not safe. The spirits are not your friends. Stay out. And I thought, okay, I have just ruined this project. Um, I am going to get accused of all kinds of nasty things. It's going to be the end of my career in these communities. Every man over 70 nodded his head and said yes. Do you go and visit grandma or not? Right? If you don't, if you don't, if you believe grandma might do really nasty things to you, right? <laughs> From the dead, then no. <laughs> you did the right thing, there's a monument, and then you get out. Right? But even there, see, 40 or 30 and below. No, we should be maintaining this. We should be visiting the graves, right? We should be showing this other kind of care. Not for the 80-year-old guys. Uh-uh. These things are very culturally tied, right? And culturally bound. So again, in the tradition that I grew up in, you, um, and maybe some of you may have had contact with the Hispanic community that's grown so big here. It's very much like that. You went and visited. Right? You came out, you cleaned up the grave, you sat down, you talked to the person, you told stories about him. We didn't bring food, but you know, it was like a family visit. It was they like going to grandma's night. house. They have the day of the dead. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the day of the dead in Mexico. Back in Lithuania, where part of my family is from, uh, women would embroider special, they call them clothes, but like stoles. And you would go and put the stole over the gravestone and put out a picnic and sit down and visit, and then, you know, whoever's down there, you know, gets to partake in the spirit of the picnic, then you get to drink the vodka, eat the sausage, and or hard-boiled eggs. Uh, <laughs> um, these are really living things. And so all of it is bound in time, and all of it is bound in religion and custom, which are also built in time. So it's always a moving target, right? You need to know the time, the people, and something about their culture when you're trying to find a cemetery or understand burial practices and the reasons behind them. So thank you very much for your indulgence. And I'll answer any questions.